<laughs> Let's make this happen. All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is David Serres. I'm speaking on behalf of Unison Rights, an IME based in Europe, and I'm here to present you to the Belem project. So before going into that, so I'm a music lawyer, but this presentation does not constitute any legal advice. I have to give you the disclaimer. But as a music lawyer and an international and licensing manager at Unison Rights Spain, I'm here to tell you a little bit about lyrics, their importance, and basically music lyrics and how do you monetize those. So it's very important that you know that after this webinar, you can always reach us to have like private uh, communication, private mentoring, and it's free of charge in the sense that we are supported by the European Union in this Belem project. So let's get into it. So we would start with the first sentence, which is books have translations, films and TV have subtitles or dubbing, opera has subtitles or supertitles live and online. But commercial and non-commercial music is far behind the other art forms when it comes to overcoming the language barrier. So that's the reason why Belem was born. Belem means boosting European lyrics via entrepreneurial monetization. And we at Unison, an independent management entity, we manage publishing rights for music publishers, songwriters, and lyricists. We are in charge of the capacitation webinars. So Belem, like I told you, it stands for boosting European lyrics and their entrepreneurial monetization. And it is intended to foster the licensing, aggregation, distribution, exhibition, and translation for meaning, we'll see that later, of music lyrics, and greatly increase the monetization of European lyrics and lyric translations for meaning. It's try to like benefit the audience and lead to increased language diversity and understanding globally with translated lyrics crossing and breaking borders. So we are not only talking about physical, we are talking about digital and virtual, but also live concert, all the formats that you can imagine and that we'll see later. So it is not an utopia. The future, what we want with the Belem project is that the lyrics and the lyric translations for meaning are distributed globally. And we want virtual and live concerts by European artists will be produced with subtitles, singing in their native languages or a mixture of languages. And it is very, very important to understand that lyrics, balam, monetization, it's key structure to spread native languages and to monetize a part of the publishing rights that have not been monetized properly during the last few years. So, yeah, so this is so, really interesting to me about the translation. So, David, could you talk a little bit more about, like, the process of the translation? And if is that what Belem is doing? How is this, how does exactly this work? It's very interesting. Normally, when we talk about lyrics translation, we talk about, like, or we know about, like, closed caption, you know, like you do. We see it, like, it works properly, and I will explain it later, but it works better and better, like Google Translator from English to Spanish and Spanish to English due to, to, to what we all know, but it doesn't work quite well when it comes to, when I call them minor languages, those are not like minor languages. We are talking about, for instance, Portuguese, which is spoken in Portugal, Brazil, all the, the African speaking countries or French spoken in France, the, 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 the French territories and part of Canada. When you come to, the, or for instance, Catalan, uh, which is spoken in Catalonia and it's in several other former Catalonian countries, right? So uh, when you are talking about such languages, it's very, very difficult to have like accurate translations and translations for meaning that we'll touch on it later. Because when you are translating a lyric of a music, you are translating something that comes from the mind and the core of the author, the lyricist, it's not like it cannot be like a mechanical one. And mm -hmm. in the Belem project, we have several open calls uh, between. Uh, so the open calls are intended for publishers to apply and get a financing by the Belem project to get real people translating K 
catalogs or specific works. And it's like there are open calls, a few ended in the end of March, but we'll open more calls. So you please stay tuned at the balam.music website because it's like real humans doing real translations. There's also the global lyrics project, the GLP, which you can also visit and mm -hmm. Peter will share you the link later on, which is a, a very, very good project sponsored sponsored or uh, involved by Robert Singerman and, and several other people that have been fighting for lyrics since, I don't know, 20 years ago. And it's destined to, to provide proper translation for meaning for uh, music lyrics. You know, it's really what we found interesting. I mean, this going back to the 80s and uh, Nana with 99 uh, red balloons. So in the U.S. it was 99 red balloons. And and then from but the, the original German was 99 Luftballons. But what was really interesting, and it's kind of a little side note, was that in America, we they had the, you know, the English version, but we actually were more fans of the German version. I think actually that became more popular. So you never know, like even in a different language, you know, the initial original language, which also t it has more different emotion because you're singing your natural language. So there's, you know, you're talking about that, but then like the translation. So it's just a little side note there. No, uh, that was really an interesting case study. Absolutely interesting, Peter. And for, I'm a big fan of Cesaria Evra. She sings in Portuguese and in Criollo, Cape Verdean Criollo. So for foreigners to understand the, the the intensity of the wording there of the lyrics, it's like uh, beautiful, you know, it's like Goran Bregovic. If I could understand so many languages from the Balkans, I love the music. I sort of understand, like you said, Peter, the emotions there. But if I could get the lyrics immediately with proper translation, mm -hmm. not like automatic one, it would be amazing. It, right it, it is amazing with what we are doing. Currently. Exactly. It's fantastic. So let's, let's continue because we're going to talk a little bit more on the translation, but there's so, there's a lot to cover that and so many great things. And hello, Angela, how you doing? Yes. These are great insights. So uh, we got, we got plenty more. So, so let's, uh, why continue. lyrics and translation for meaning? So on an European level, and I'm always talking about it, uh, Europe because this is an European uh, funded project, many state CMOs, CMOs, it's like PROs. You would call it PROs in the US, like ASCAP, BMI, CZAC, and et cetera. CMOs normally is the European term that are used because they encompass both performing and reproduction rights. So a lot of member state CMOs and European music publishers are still not participating in, not benefiting from these existing re revenue streams, and they are not prepared for incipient new revenue streams, such as lyric translations for meaning. So we are focusing on revenue streams such as lyric exhibition, lyric translation, lyric digitization, and lyric synchronization. And other BLAM project major goals are to allow the European-based works to be distributed with lyric translations for meaning, thus legalizing currently unauthorized digital sales around the globe. And also while we are monetizing or the partners, the publishers are monetizing the views, we have to expand the business models for European musical works. So we want to drive new revenue streams to European authors, composers, and publishers. We want to provide new digital tools for the right holders to control the lyrics. And we want to boost the co-creation and co-production of new European works and recordings. What about translation for meaning? Like I told you in the beginning, like music history in the 60s and the 70s, it was fairly common for English language artists to also record versions in French, German, or Italian. And naturally, the 20th century led to the Anglo-American linguistic dominance that accompanied US-led globalization since the 80s. As above mentioned, we notably, with notable exceptions when the US industry wants to capitalize on Latin or Asian needs by turning their mainstream. If you think about it, Although European music is not generally currently utilizing such strategies, in the US, Asia, Africa, and Latin, lyric translation remains an obvious key to success. Just look at Despacito case or Justin Bieber cases. So it's very important that you know that closed caption exists, but it's automatic lyric translation and it's often inaccurate. And we are talking about multilingual collaborations 
which work well in English, Spanish, but if you go to minority languages like Portuguese or French or Polish or Swedish, it's very difficult that the closed caption works good. So again, with the, with the captions, and you know, we look at say like tying this in with sync, and you uh, say you, you're watching something on Netflix, and you have the soundtrack, and they start putting the lyrics to the song in the in the in the captions. Now, Netflix, with many of the series, have you can go click your audio, you know, uh, and those are subtitles, and to all the different languages. So is this something that is like, how is this monetizable or is it, is this something that they're auto translating or is this something that Bellum is also looking at getting involved? Is there, is there a tie in there? Thank you for that question, Peter. Absolutely interesting and giving practical inputs to all the attendees here. It's, it's, it's vital. Just let me say I to, to Freddie and to Lyric Find, I was talking about Robert, uh, Mm -hmm. Singerman from Lyric Find and also Freddie works with us at the Balam project, Lyric Find is pioneering a lot for all of this. So thank you for being here, Freddie, and thank you for sharing the Global Lyric Project website. So Peter, uh, one thing that I've learned in like my first days working for the Portuguese CMO in the past with a, a big friend of mine is the legal, the head of legal of that CMO. He always said, you have always to look at the principles. So, and the principles regarding copyright law is that for each usage, you need an authorization, okay? So if the radio wants to use music, the radio needs to get an authorization from the publishing rights rights holders. But then if a coffee is playing music from the radio, they need another authorization. So each authorization, each, each usage requires an authorization. And normally those authorizations, unless you are using like some sort of Creative Commons, or if you are in the public domain, or if there are any other exceptions, those pay royalties and they monetize. So that's a revenue flow, a revenue stream to publishing rights right holders or their heirs. So regarding usage of lyrics, it's exactly the same logic that we need to follow and that we follow. So Whenever you see lyrics on major streaming uh, platforms or VODs, as you were mentioning, those lyrics and the translation of those lyrics. So you got authorization to display the lyrics, but also to translate the lyrics. So at least there are two levels of authorization. OK, so one to fix the lyric, then fix or fixate the lyric to put it there, then to translate the lyric. And that requires special authorization because sometimes, and I won't, I, I won't get very much into that, but when you are translating, some legal frameworks require not only the intervention of the one who controls the rights, that normally is the publisher, but also from the author himself or from his heirs, his or heirs. So imagine that for each usage of lyrics in a VOD service, you need to have authorization for displaying and for having the translation in place. And that is then collected through different vehicles. So each one of these authorizations requires a payment. And I won't be doing any endorsement here, but I enjoy very much uh, what Amazon Prime, what they have on their VOD service in the sense that when you are watching a series, you can also, you have the, 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 the musical information on if you on your cell phone you know so you are watching bosch which is one of my favorite series a lot of chess <laughs> and you know like all the all the music that is going you have like normally the songwriters the artists so it's something cool as well but regarding your question authorization is necessary it's in place and it means monetization and it's something that we also try to 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 enlighten the the balam uh people who attend our webinars and and mentoring sessions wonderful wonderful all right well webinar let's continue uh with with this here we go good so those are the three goals that we have also with translation for meaning part of the balan project who are the partners then am i portugal deezer france dot music conglomerate lyric find you all know them nord university from norway 
ruined the encompassing the Balkans. Unison ourselves, Zebralution from Germany, also the managing partner for the entire project. And then the core part of the project, the publisher, Solizitanian from Portugal, Independent Digital from Poland, Bardi's Music from Ireland, Brahma 16 from London, Metadron from Italy, Mars Music from Sweden, and Flip It from France. So those are the key partners, and we'll now get an intro into what are lyrics. So lyrics are an essential component of a song. I do. I do just want to just interrupt for one quick second here. So the Go partners, ahead. you know, what what is the role with all the partners working together? I mean, that you have, and those those companies are great organizations. And you know, we've mentioned Lyric Fine as well, and you know, we've known that they've been fighting the good fight for years about this. Uh, but you know, what what are the roles of these other organizations working together? As a, uh, thank you, Peter, as in any European project. And this one, if I'm not wrong, and Robert, if you are watching and, and I'm wrong, please correct me, but you have an evaluation. And we got like 95 in 100. It's like it, it was the highest evaluation ever when they presented the project uh, to, to the European Commission. So it, it was like was like a huge one and you have several partners and the idea of the ones who wrote the project was to encompass different sectors in the music industry that touch with lyrics you see the example of zebralution digital distribution right so you have one end then you have these are dsp another end then you have unison rights management of copyrights another end then you have the core the music publishers who are, you know, all of those companies are indie publishers, very well known in their own countries. So within the European project, each each partner or each partner to the Balam consortium is allocated with specific tasks. Unison, for instance, is allocated to providing webinars and education to music publishers across Europe and the globe. But you have other partners like Deezer who are responsible for dissemination of, of, of lyrics and of dissemination of the project. You have several partners, each one with the mission. But in the end, the absolute, like the, the, the you know, the, the basic and fundamental idea, it's to have the music industry community understanding about the importance of lyrics, how to monetize them and translation for meaning and then you can boost like minority or native languages in being understood. Then you can create new revenue streams and flows to music that was not benefiting from them. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, let, let's continue. This is great insights. They convey the message and emo emotions that the artist wants to express. And naturally, lyrics are protected by copyright law. In recent years, we have seen huge high-profile lawsuits regarding unauthorized use of music and lyrics. You can name them like Blurred Lines, Gotta Give It Up. And those cases as, are a reminder that authorization must be acquired before using any type of music right. So it's natural, like I told you before, that the history of lyrics is closely connected or tied to the development of music itself. In ancient civilizations like Greece, Rome, and Egypt, music was often intertwined with poetry. And obviously during the Baroque era and until nowadays, lyrics have been present, present, present as of the 19th century as well. And you can see them rising with jazz, blues, rock music, where lyrics often used to express political or social messages. They are so important that can, they can be used in a variety of contexts, both online and offline. And if you think about it, and when we talk about monetization, those are the contexts context where you, as a rights holder or administrating rights for someone else, you can monetize lyrics. You can authorize, you can license, and you can earn income from music recordings, live performances, music videos, advertising, but also television and film, karaoke, websites and social media, and merch. So lyrics are an essential part of a song and they are often what makes a song memorable and impactful. As such, they can be a valuable asset for rights holders, including songwriters, music publishers, and record labels. So 
what if to really just simplify something here, you know, as a lyricist or a top liner, you know, the a musician or writer, so whether it's an artist is I'm writing lyrics for an artist or for myself. When you know we talk about the monetization in a simplified way, where am I collecting that revenue from? So you have basically, I would say, three ways like direct licensing if you want to do direct licensing which is not advisable in the majority of the cases okay but you can do direct licensing the other way it's through your music publisher if you are like a lyricist and you have a music publisher but then it opens like how will your music publisher collect the money or the monies or the royalties from such lyrics and they can do it via CMOs or IMEs, and they can also do it via partners like Lyric Find, who are dedicated to helping like music publishers and other right holders like Unison as well. We have agreement with Lyric Find to help them collect the money flowing from the lyrics. Then you have several, several types of usages that are only or normally collected, collected directly via the CMO. And I'm talking about publishing rights, not master rights. So they are collected via the CMO or PRO, Performing Rights Organization, or RRO. And we are more talking about like the offline usages, or if you if you think about like television, um, if you think about like live display of lyrics. So I would say that you have like pra practically you can do direct licenses. You can collect through parties that are very present in such world like lyric fine and you can also collect true cmos or pros or ROs. but one does not exclude the other so you can do you can be collecting from certain types of usages directly from other types of usages through lyric find and from other types of usages through unison and when i say lyric find and unison i refer to the key players or players in those industries you know Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. And if any, again, if anybody has some questions in the chat, feel free to just drop them in. We're just, we're just going through this and uh, we have a little bit more. So let's see what else. I mean, continue with the importance of lyrics here. They are very, very important in terms of revenue generation, brand recognition and copyright protection. But also they are very important regarding creative expression and cultural significance. Again, minority languages and translation for meaning. So Overall, we believe that the importance of lyrics for right holders lies in their ability to generate revenue, establish a brand identity, and protect their creative works and contribute to the cultural fabric of society. Obviously, when you talk about usages, licenses, there are rights involved. And to use lyrics legally, one must obtain authorization from the copyright owner or from the songwriter. Uh, or from the music publisher, or from the CMO, or IME, or PRO, or RRO that represent the lyrics rights, and this can be done through a licensing deal. Normally, in Europe, we would say that two types of rights are involved. Economic rights, those are the patrimonial rights, the, the royalties and the monies that That was really interesting. <laughs> David, uh, I just, it just yeah. gave me a little error. So, uh, while no you worries. were talking, yeah. So, um, when Jesse had a question here, so while I'm going to get that video back, uh, okay. Jesse, uh, when considering indie artists and DYI, how can indie artists use their ability to write lyrics to generate revenue? How can one make money writing lyrics if they are not also composers? So that's a great question because it's you know it's separate from the music in that sense and i'm going to tie in a, a part two to that is mm -hmm. we talk about merch and we were talking about like how to collect you know royalties from like you know the song itself but when you're using lyrics and merch how is that collected so uh we'll start with jesse's <laughs> and then i'm gonna go uh see what happened try here to fix, try to fix it Peter. so thank you very much jesse for 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 the two questions and thank you peter for for that question as well so Jesse, uh, so going to your second question, when you say, how can one make money writing lyrics if they are not also composers? So normally you would be writing lyrics and then you have to pitch those lyrics to like 
music publishers or someone who's going to find and that nowadays uh, i had this discussion a lot with clients of mine as, as music lawyer and uh, music publishers they complain a lot that people nowadays they don't quite understand what they do they understand the the, the role of the, the the record label and the manager and the booking agent but when it comes to understanding the role of a music publisher they they just don't understand the importance of a music publisher and a music publisher I would say that it's the key, key, key partner for you to find uh, composers who want to use your lyrics or for finding an artist who's already working with the composer and that they need a lyricist. But not only music publishers, but also if you go like to, if you apply yourself to songwriting camps and etc. there are a lot of ongoing initiatives. I think last year at the IMPF in Palma, the International Music Publishers Forum, which is something very positive that happened in the industry. And they organized an event in Palma, the Mallorca last year, and they had like a songwriting camp for songwriters of the publishers that, who I think they were associated with the IMPF. And it was amazing because there were lyrics being made, there were compositions being made, and then there was like a, a listening session. It was amazing. So. I would say if you have a music publisher or if you have like a, uh, someone who can connect you to composers or to songwriting camps, that would be a way. Also, nowadays you have several different ways of exposing your work digitally or other formats, but you have to be careful when doing that and you have to have it properly protected before doing that. But I'm not giving any legal advice here, so there's the legal disclaimer again. Uh, going to your first question, when considering indie artists and do-it-yourself, uh, DIY, how can indie artists use their ability to write lyrics to 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 generate revenue? Well, that's basically going back to your first question. Indies they surpass the amount of revenues generated when it comes to like the the global music industry revenues. They are growing and growing, and growing, and nowadays. You not only have like the indie publishers and indie labels, you have the indie artists and indie songwriters growing a lot. And there's like community and there's like forums and there's like places where you can exchange information and try to get in with people that would be like composers. But you can basically do it all by yourself. The problem is exposure and how to make money. One key piece of advice that I give you, Jesse, and all of you who are watching is please, if you are like songwriters or if you are rights owners, please do get a registration with the CMO or with an IME. It can be either Unison or BMI or ASCAP or SASAM or PRS, but you get your registration with a PRO or CMO because that's the main way for you to make sure that you are collecting monies from usages that you could not collect humanly possibly directly by yourself so this is like the advice that i can give you it's no it's not a legal advice it's like wise business advice for your career do get a registration with the with the with the cmos and imes of the world right on okay just let me go back to 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 jesse jesse thank you very much for for your words you are the one who is amazing because you are the one writing lyrics i'm just a bureaucrat here but if you don't get registered, I wouldn't like to give you like proper legal advice. And uh, I know that I cannot do it uh, when you ask if you don't register your song with a PRO, but you post lyric quotes of your of our own. Will they be protected because we post them? <laughs> this depends a lot from from country to country, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Copyright doesn't need normally to to be registered to be protected, but in some jurisdictions you you need to have the registration then to to file the lawsuit or at least to get damages in such laws to ask for damages in such lawsuit or in other countries you don't need to do anything but it's advisable that you do a proper registration with your the institution that that is doing the registrations or uh you do the declaration of work with uh, with the cmo pro uh which or ime like unison so that's that's what i can i can tell you i cannot go deeper into that and uh the answer regarding merch yeah 
also lyric fine they 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 collect from merch and uh several other players are working in that field if you use like a cap or a hat or a t-shirt with a lyric we know that there's a huge amount of unauthorized usage but we advocate at Valam project for the authorized for the authorized users of such content so please check for material loop that is properly licensed and normally you have that on the tag if you are buying a cup if you are buying an ad you have the the indication that it's properly licensed yeah i mean take it like you know the, save this logo on the hat so you see a logo on a any kind of clothing now this is the music industry city logo if somebody wants to use this logo on their clothing line they have to license it so in essence it's the same as lyrics if you want to put a lyric on a hat on a t-shirt that has to be licensed and i can see that that's a very creative logo such as a lyric is creative so <laughs> Both for the logo and for the lyric, you would be talking about your logo, but also the trademark rights there and also the copyright. And if the lyric is registered as a trademark, that some are, you would need the both authorizations from the trademark perspective and the copyright perspective. So mm. going back to the to the to the presentation here, uh, can you still see it? Yes. Peter, can, can yep, you see it? There it is. Yeah, there it is. Yep. We can see okay, it. Okay. So there are like the economic rights and then the moral rights. So the economic rights are the rights that has to do with like patrimonial stuff. So it's a right to collect royalties and they include like the rights to distribute, to reproduce, to make available the work. And they are typically transferred to a music publisher or assigned or whatever to a publishing uh, deal. Then you have the moral rights and moral rights, they differ from country to country or from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. In Europe, it's something that it's standard and there's no like that with it. But uh, in the case of the US, there are like particular, there are particulars regarding the, the moral rights that are recognized for some types of uh, usages, but regarding specifically lyrics and, and, and music, it's, it's kind of a, a tricky situation. So, like I said, the types of rights involved in lyrics are generally similar when we are talking about the economic rights, but when we are talking about moral rights, it's different. And you probably you are probably wondering what are moral rights if you don't know that. I, I would like to like highlight the main like three moral rights recognized in Europe. They would include the right of attribution, the right to be identified as the creator of a work. The right of integrity it's the right to object to modifications of a work that would harm the creator's reputation and the right of disclosure the right to decide when and how a work is made available to to the public so peter i'm just seeing the presentation if there is any question from your end or from the public please speak and i will stop it okay okay I cannot listen to you. I think, I uh, yeah, th there's a there's a question here, but I think you, uh, I know in the presentation, I think if you tie it in, if you would just kind of go through the rest of the presentation, because this sure. is really important, the, the moral rights and everything. And I know there's a lot of great, uh, you know, a lot more great content. So therefore, like, we'll hold off some on some final questions at the end. Yeah, we can go through the, all the questions. Right. Please do that in the chat mm -hmm. and uh, I will try to speed things up. So. Yeah, but regarding there's there's a main difference there, and how can I, how could I give you an example? For instance, uh, the right of integrity or the right to object. Imagine some that someone was translating your lyrics to North Korean, and due to the opposition that you as a songwriter has to uh, you have to the to the North Korean regime, and for instance. You could object to to that that type of usage and that type of modification of your work, and that would be within the moral rights. Even though your economical rights that would be assigned to a third party and that third party could explore them, you with the moral rights you always have like sort of a final word to say no. I don't want that. Me as a lyricist, I don't want that to happen. So please stop it. What? is very important and also tricky as the song as the lyricist you have the right in several jurisdictions mainly in europe that's the ones that i i know 
best to withdraw your work from circulation, even though you have like agreements in place to the exploitation of, of that work. You have that right under the moral rights, okay? But that doesn't mean that you don't have to identify the parties, the bona fide parties who are armed by your decision. So you may have to identify them, but the moral rights, they are so connected with the with the lyricist himself or herself that they have the final word about, about the lyrics. Naturally, if you have agreements in place, you have to respect those agreements. So you are talking about an absolute right that you have and you can always exercise. But then you are talking about private relationship rights with, between natural or legal persons that you need to respect. And so if you exercise one, you may have an impact on, on, on the other ones. But that's the how, how the moral rights are very, very powerful uh, tool for songwriters and, and composers and lyricists. So uh, I would like I, I sort of misled you guys when I told you that for each usage, you need to have an authorization and that such authorization requires uh, requires uh, the, the license and the payment of a royalty. No, it's not always like that. There are like exceptions. We've talked about the Creative Commons, the Creative Commons exceptions, the CC ones, that someone can define how it, how the work can be used and if it can be freely used and commercially used, blah, blah. Also, there are like two main, I would say, the institutes differing from Europe to, to, to the US. In the US, you have the fair use logic where it may happen that a use of a lyric is found to not to have to pay royalties or it's like an exception to the requirement of authorization and that goes under the fair use that normally goes like case or it's case law based and then in europe there's normally a closed list approach to the exceptions and the burn convention three-step test so there is like a, a closed list of exceptions if it's not on the list of exceptions it's not an exception, so requ uh, you need to have a proper authorization in place. And in addition to 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 the to not being in the exceptions, if it is in the exceptions, you have to respect other two steps. And uh, one, the most important one, is that even if your usage is allowed to be used, uh, sorry for the redundance, without having the authorization, there's a second part of it that it says if it conflicts with the normal exploitation of the work. Although it's an exception, you cannot do it. So in Europe, things are a little bit rough sometimes in terms of like you need to, 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 to respect it a lot. Just for you to have an idea, and I will be very brief with this. I, I had a client of, of mine. They're launching a, a metaverse platform, platform. And they asked us to like to check if there was an exception in Portugal to show like 50 something monuments and we had to apply like for some of those, the, the, the burn convention three step test, this, mm -hmm. and if, if it's not allowed, they cannot use it. Same with lyrics. So I'm, I'm, I think I'm almost finishing, uh, but legal framework, the main legal framework for us working in Europe and Balam is an European project. There are several main copyright treaties, conventions, and directives and regulations in force in Europe, but we have three very important ones, the Bern Convention, the WIBO Copyright Treaties from 96, and the InfoSoc Directive. And now, since 2019, what we call the Copyright Directive, which came up with the uh, infamous, uh, for some famous for others, Article 17, which was Article 13, uh, and for which some of us lobbied from one end and the other end. And those would be the main pieces of legislation. Like uh, Bill Bryson once said, and this is a, like a, 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 a proper good one lyric language, never forget, it's more fashion than science. And matters of usage, spelling and pronunciation tend to wander around like hemlines. So, unison at the Balam project, but the Balam project itself, we are at your 
total availability to book follow-up mentoring sessions where we can go in depth into some of the points and try to help you on how to monetize and how to understand the lyrics rights, what you are doing, what you need to do. And also, Peter, just to clarify all the attendees that this is just the first part of the, the live seminar. We have another part that it's more like dealing with the tech tools and the solutions for detection of infringement and also how to, to articulate with players like Lyric Fine and CMOs and etc. And I think that in a few months will be, or weeks, we'll be announcing the follow-up. But in the meantime, please reach us and book mentoring sessions. And please go to the FMF if you want, uh, <laughs> because we'll meet each other there in person, Alan, and we'll be happy to, to share more knowledge with you. Thank you, guys. Wonderful. Thank, th thank you so much. You can, uh, you can, uh, stop sharing your screen there. So, cause I, I turned it off on the, on the stage here. So, um, it, that was fantastic. And th there were a few questions in here, uh, that kind of tie in a little bit with what you were saying. So, um, we had, a uh, one question, what would you say for fans? So this might be a little bit outside the scope. This is, uh, and I know you can't give legal advice. Okay. But you, you know, you can talk about certain things. Uh, it's a two-parter. What would you say to uh, for fans who bring T-shirts with the artist picture or brand in live concerts? Should a rule be communicated when ticket purchasing on the website? It's kind of the same thing for lyrics on T-shirts fans may wear during the concerts. So this kind of is like, you know, goes into the scalping and all that and everything. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a very interesting question and could give like room for, for, for a big discussion. And like, like Hamina said, and, uh, like Peter said as well, you, we are now talking just about lyrics and publishing rights, which falls within the copyright category. But with what Peter said and with Amina's question, you are not only talking about uh, their copyright law, but also trademark law, which is industrial property. As you know, it's a branch of intellectual property that includes patents, trademarks, and design patents. And then... Uh, you are also talking about artist picture. So you are talking about personality rights and image rights. And that's another world. Uh, it's mm -hmm. also negotiated when you are talking about VOD licenses and, and also rec recording deals and it. But I think that it would give room to, to another conference. Absolutely. And thank you for the question. I mean, yeah. That's great. Uh, well, one final question. I uh, just hope as we wrap up and uh, so this person's name is IP Law GR. So just prepping you, it has law in the name. So uh, it's like, since the project aims at empowering European repertoire in the sense of reaching bigger audiences, would representation agreements with Anglo-American PROs make sense? Are there any in place? Great question. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. And I see GR. I'm not sure if it's from Greece, if it is. A big hello to all my friends there. Uh, I'm a big fan. Regarding what you said, IP Law GR, it's a very interesting question. It is, it is aimed at empowering European repertoire. It is. And it's not with the Balam project to establish Anglo-American uh, agreements with the Anglo-American PROs. It is with the partners within Balam, the partners of the consortium, that they need or they should have in place agreements to cover also the Anglo-American PRO's territories of exploitation. And that's very important. Uh, we, as Unison writes an IME, which is a private collective management entity, we have agreements to cover the, the, the US territory. If you are talking about Lyric Fine, not a CMO nor IME, but doing licenses in that field, they also cover the, the US territory. They cover several territories. And if you talk with the majority of the CMOs in Europe, again, just let me clarify this. CMOs, when we refer to them as these, they normally include performing rights and reproduction rights. Whereas when we talk about PROs, we are talking only about the performer, the performing right organizations. But the majority of the CMOs in Europe and across the globe, the ones who are normally part of CSAC, the Confederation of International Societies of Authors and Composers, 
that englobs more than 200 societies from all over the world. They normally have reciprocity agreements or unilateral agreements to the representation of the repertoire across the globe. We at Unison, we have more than 90 countries covered, a lot of agreements. So our repertoire, repertoire is represented directly in those countries. When we can do direct licensing, we do as the majority of the main uh, digital licensors nowadays. But we trust a lot in the chain of agreements that we have and in the work that is done by by partners in the other countries. So I hope I have clarified this, this, this question. It's not with Balam as a consortium to have those deals. It is with the partners of Balam, Unison and the publishers or their, I am, their CMOs of, of affiliation to have such agreements in place with the American PROs. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, that's great. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, David, thank you and Balam and everybody at Unison and all, all the partners involved for, you know, do, you know, doing such great work to, you know, really help monetize something and look out for the creators in this space. So thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank yeah. you for all, to all the attendees. And thank you, Music Industry City and Future Music Forum to have us uh, here. Thank you very much, guys. And yeah, and I look forward to seeing you in Barcelona in September. Free beer will be there. <laughs> <laughs> right on, right on. All right. Thanks a lot, David. I'll see everybody soon. Thanks for joining us.